Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to The Caring Economy with me, Toby Usnick. Today is a real joyful day for me because we get to interview Errol Barnett. He's the award-winning CBS News anchor and national correspondent based here in New York at the network's headquarters. He's the only Black British broadcaster on American television today, so he holds a distinct perspective on global events through a reporting career that spans more than two decades and five continents. Barnett appears regularly across all CBS News programs and platforms and has anchored a number of CBS special reports as well. From live coverage of the Supreme Court ruling of the dramatic ending of Roe v. Wade this year to the death of Queen Elizabeth II, to contentious exchanges with presidents Joe Biden, Donald Trump, and even the U.S. Secret Service, which we will talk about, Barnett regularly presses for answers on the biggest issues of our time from wherever they happen. Errol Barnett, welcome to The Caring Economy. Toby, thank you so much. A very nice welcome. And what a privilege it is to kind of get time again to chat with you and spend some time having a fun conversation. Thanks for having me. Uh, Errol, we always ask our guests to tell us uh, maybe a digest of their lives at the beginning, where you grew up, how you got where you got, maybe some mentors or bumps and pivots along the way. So, Well, I am the fortunate recipient to all the best England has to offer. I was born in the 80s in one of its first planned cities of Milton Keynes to a mum from Liverpool and a father whose family emigrated from Jamaica after World War II. And all I knew when it started was just fun, music, energy, a fresh, safe community where you never had to cross a road to get around town. Ultimately, my mother would remarry an American who was in the Air Force. And that's how we made a big jump when I was 10 years old from the green countryside of England to the deserts of Phoenix, Arizona. And that's where I would ultimately go to high school after suffering a pretty major uh, tragedy in my family with the death of my older sister, um, yeah. which happened quite suddenly. And that led to my mother and stepfather divorcing. And my mother fell into a very deep depression. I did as well, but we didn't seek therapy for it. And so I was effectively left as a brown teenage British boy in Arizona, um, having to fend for myself and figure things out. And in high school, it was journalism and a news program we had called Channel One News, which was broadcast across the United States, mm -hmm. um, that gave me my first opportunity at figuring out what I wanted to do with life. Uh, long story short, that turned into my first job. They hired me on my 18th birthday, moved me to Los Angeles where I then started to work effectively on a Hollywood soundstage. I don't know if anyone remembers the show Whose Line Is It Anyway. That was recording in the soundstage next to us while we were doing our news program for American teenagers. And I was one of the youngest anchor reporter they brought on board. For me, I had lots of ups and lots of downs, but I thought that an opportunity to work as a journalist and not just travel the world, but travel all throughout the United States and figure things out was something I couldn't pass up. Use the money I made from Channel One to pay my way through college. I've got a degree in political science with a focus on international relations. I thought, hey, why not study the stuff I'm so curious about? Shortly after graduation, I was hired by CNN correspondent as an anchor, relocating me from Atlanta to London to Abu Dhabi during the Arab Spring to Johannesburg, uh, where I hosted a show called Inside Africa, traveled to 22 countries in two years, also covered the death of Nelson Mandela, which was just incredible as far as absorbing and learning and being a part of history. And that was all before they'd bring me back to the States for CNN Newsroom. I realized traveling the world is wonderful, but I'd love to have a life. My girlfriend turned into my now wife. Um, who has been with me the entire time I've been with CBS News. And I'm speaking to you from the CBS Broadcast Center on 57th Street. So you might hear some emergency <laughs> sirens in the background and the, sure. the hustle and bustle of New York life. But I'm now here working for CBS after working as a White House correspondent, a transportation correspondent, and um, just loving not just the challenges, but all the opportunities I've been given in my life. And as you mentioned, as the only Black British broadcaster on American television, I just feel this responsibility to report back from all these places I've been, all these experiences I've had as we all face you know, a very uncertain and unpredictable future. It's all inspiring, honestly, Errol, for our listeners who might not know the UK, but Milton Keynes, like 
<laughs> Describe why it's so significant, because I don't think most Americans can appreciate it. Special about the UK is that everywhere you look, you'll find a piece of history, whether they're cottages, castles, meadows. Um, you look, the royal family itself is a vestige from hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. And what was unusual about where I grew up is it was part of the UK's post-World War II effort to create affordable housing. And rather than, you know, a development here or there, they wanted to create a full encompassing city. It's really a town, but don't tell us that. They they found some rolling countryside in the Midlands and said, we're going to put it right here across what used to be known as Milton Keynes Village. And in the center of town, we had a, a commercial district, England's first indoor mall, in fact, first fast food drive through, which I don't know that we're too proud about. But the idea was that you could work and live and thrive in a community where children could play. We had things called redways, which were kind of rubber lined roads that you could ride your bike or your skateboard or run and not have to cross a major road. The idea back then was to have lots of roundabouts so you never had to stop. And ironically, before the Queen passed away, she was scheduled to anoint Milton Keynes a city once and for all, now that its population has crossed 250,000. For me, it represents idealism and diversity, and I've actually tried to carry that no matter where I've been. So it's basically the suburbs of England. Awesome. And we see utopian uh, experiments here in the U.S. throughout our history. So I, I'm always fascinated by those who strive for a better place. I mean, you're the national transportation correspondent, CBS, but I do recall hearing somewhere in the past year about there's a trend in this country of move toward roundabouts because apparently yeah. they are better for the environment, far less idling, far fewer accidents. But there's one particular roundabout near a bridge where everybody crashes because they don't slow down in time. You know, when there's no traffic lights or lines in the road, it forces you both as a driver and as a pedestrian to pay attention. That's a great analogy for how we should all be navigating life. Yes, we want to be safe and we want to follow the rules of the road, but we really should be paying attention to each other a little more as we navigate things. Tell us a little bit about your the loss of your sister and, and what impact that had on your life and, and how your family, your mom and all pivoted. Yeah, I appreciate the question, Toby. And it's interesting because it is not something I speak about publicly. But during the pandemic, when we were all effectively being collectively traumatized by mass death and the, the prospect that perhaps something would happen to us, I know we've all lost someone close to us. Writing about my experiences when I was younger because I didn't at the time have the privilege of processing it or going through professional therapy. I just saw my mother falling to pieces and my stepfather, you know, falling into depression, Iraq war vet, he was experiencing PTSD. She was a very popular track star, an outgoing young girl in high school and was with her boyfriend one weekend. And according to what the police told us, there was an accident with a gun between the two of them um, that night. And as a result, she was injured, had a head injury, and was effectively brain dead from that moment on. I was I was 12 years old. So I'm new to America. Our family is just starting to absorb the excitement of living in the American suburbs and chasing our own American dream. And they were faced with the prospect of what to do with Natalie, is her name, who was effectively brain dead in a hospital. Um, ultimately, it would be in high school when I finally had some freedom on my own opportunities that I, I ran track as she did. I literally followed in her footsteps, in her track cleats, running the same hurdle races, the same four by one relays. And I I felt that her spirit was with me in high school because as a as a brown British person sounding like this, I really did stick out. And I wanted to, like everyone else does, just fit in. Because of the reputation she had, she was so popular, so well loved. They were really welcoming to me. And that effectively set the stage for the career I've pursued since mm -hmm. in television. Um, because I didn't want people asking me, oh, where are you from and why are you here? Which yeah. is still to this day the biggest question I get. I don't want to tell them about this really traumatic, terrible story. I don't want other people's pity. And what I found was it was easier for me to turn the tables and ask people about themselves. People love to talk about themselves. Oh, yes. Recommend that to anyone out there that whenever you feel uncomfortable or not like you want to reveal much more, 
ask the person who's speaking to you questions about themselves, you'll likely be surprised at how forthcoming they may be. But certainly it's still still a massive loss I, I deal with every day. Sorry for that loss. I take an active interest in people when I'm with them. At this point in my life, I just go deep with someone on my left or right. I don't try and work the room. It's a genuine interest and I find it's always revealing. But my husband will often say to the people I'm talking to, you know, he's Barbara Walters. You don't have to answer all his questions. And I say, I'm very happy to answer any questions they want to ask of me. Very telling when you have a conversation with someone and they mention something that you'll, oh, tell me more about that. Some folks don't turn around and ask you the same question. Um, Do you have kind of a favorite era in journalism? I mean, they're all additive. They got you where you are. But do you prefer being in the anchor seat? Would you rather be out on the reporting beat? What's, What's sort of your sweet spot? At Channel One, it was an opportunity to learn about this town in between L.A. and New York called America, you know, small town, Texas, a town called Itasca. And I tell people this when I travel internationally and they come to the States, the big cities are awesome. That's where the landmarks are. But, you know, the United States stretches across not just four, but like five or six time zones when you consider Alaska and Hawaii. And so I really do encourage people to kind of explore the, the great mountain states and the west and and the deep south and even pockets in the northeast. So that was good when I came to the States and the adventure through Africa completely changed my life. Also to a similar degree, more than 50 nations stretching across both hemispheres. You've got more than a billion people, all religions, both the experience at Channel One and with CNN through the African continent and the Middle East, where I was based for a short time was something I was pursuing professionally at an incredible personal cost. I wasn't truly able to develop personal relationships that went beyond the newsroom. Mm -hmm. Um, And that includes, you know, the women I dated. It was kind of very location specific. When I came back to the States and I was anchoring CNN Newsroom, a conscious decision, maybe you really do need to spend some time working on your personal life. And rather than take a job assignment and fill in your personal life, prioritize your personal life, and then see what comes with that. My wife is an example of that. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to make this relationship work. And I'm going to find a job that allows me to have this. Even when you have your own internal wake up call, Mm -hmm. and you realize it's, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like the expression, no matter where you go, there you are. There you are. It's like, I can't keep complaining about bosses and assignments and opportunities. It's me. It's me. I've got to set the boundaries to really allow the happiness to thrive and to be vulnerable, which I know we all struggle with. Um, And I encourage people to, as far as they're comfortable, fall into that vulnerability because that's where you get some of the best growth. Talk a little bit about your own safety when you go into unsafe Mm -hmm. places and situations. Any notable stories to share? I would say that when I was doing Inside Africa, we were in, strangely enough, one of the most prickly situations we were in was completely unexpected, which maybe says something. Um, We were in Madagascar covering, you know, their famed lemurs. And we were touring one of the beautiful national parks in the north, which have these um, medieval rock formations. You know, we were captivated. Our cameraman was captivated. It was just myself, my producer, a young woman named Aja Harris, our cameraman, Ben Adams, um, our fixer, our local fixer. The (laughs) network will hire a local producer who knows the language, the money, the lingo, has all the contacts. Um, that's basically your liaison with everyone there. We didn't realize how deep in the park we had moved. So we're rushing to get back as the sun is setting. So the sun sets, we're driving out of this national park and we get stopped by the National Park Service or the equivalent, who then got out of their trucks with their weapons drawn, these rifles, um, as we stayed in the vehicle. And the fixer came back to communicate that they were they wanted money pay off before we left. There's no line item on your expense reports for bribes. CNN does not pay bribes. And so that couldn't happen. End of an exhausting day. So nerves are frayed. Everything ended fine without such a payoff. But that was a a prickly situation. Say more recently, the the most scared I've been over the past decade uh, would be in Washington, D.C., outside of the Capitol, in between the Capitol and the Supreme Court, after the 2020 election, when there were 
pro-Trump protests being organized. CBS News had hired private security for us. We had finished my report. I had uh, filmed my last piece to camera in between the Capitol and the Supreme Court, and we were effectively done. But at that moment, the crowd around me started to target me just as a generic journalist, not for anything I had said or done. And they just were yelling the typical refrains, fake news, these guys are lying, you guys stole the election, really quite frightening. And so we just moved away from them. Our cameraman put his camera down just to kind of decrease the temperature a bit. But the crowd grew. And then a woman shows up with a megaphone and she gets more people to come over. And so even though you may be able to negotiate with someone one on one, this was literal mob mentality. And in the United States, there's a really horrific history when it comes to mobs and people of color like myself. Our private security was overwhelmed by this mob. We had to get behind the line of Capitol Police and the crowd remained. And this was all before January 6th. So it was very telling of what was to come. And I think it was a a very vivid example for me of the dangers of inaccurate political rhetoric that really riles people up. And when a mob gets together, dangerous things can happen as we witnessed. So can you talk about your blackness a bit as a journalist and and also just as a citizen on the street. But I just wonder how your blackness has influenced your career as far as you know. It's it's a good question. I mean, my blackness changes depending on where I go and who I'm around. Mm-hmm. In England growing up, um, you know, my mother is a white lady. So she was much more focused on raising us kids as Errol, as Natalie, as Danny, my brother's name. When we come to the US, I remember before my sister passed, one of the issues she had in high school was coming home and saying, mom, it's it's really difficult because the black kids don't want to hang out with me. They think I'm kind of too white, but the white kids aren't hanging out with me because they think I'm too black. And what am I supposed to do? I never experienced this in England. The, the, the black American experience is very unique. Um, 13% of the population here in the States is black, um, but they've been here the entire time it's been a country and they literally built the place. Whereas in England, the black population, I think, is in the low single digits. And it's a relatively new phenomenon since the immigration from colonized nations like India and J- the Jamaicas and Caribbean only really happened after the 40s and 50s. Mm-hmm. And so here in the States, I'm very proud of my blackness, read a, a script that wasn't written by myself, but one of our producers. And it was about the fentanyl um, epidemic in the country. And the line as written was, you know, coming up, we'll tell you about how, you know, fentanyl is impacting folks all over the country from some suburban teens to communities of color. And I had to stop myself and I said, guys, what do we mean by that? What is the difference of a suburban teen and a community color? And effectively, it exposed a a very short thinking bias and they removed it and we corrected it. But to me, that's the everlasting issue, which is that we are just like everybody else, no matter the shade. We come from wealthy places, middle income places and low income places. But it's the stereotyping that seems to be so pervasive that people can't shake loose despite a Barack Obama having been president, despite plenty of examples everywhere of people through all levels of society and government um, being from varied backgrounds. For me, I just see myself as a bit of a conduit between worlds, between classes, between nations to kind of say there's much more that connects us than divides us. And we've got to get that through our heads. Anything to calm people down, certainly. And Mm -hmm. we're all guilty of getting heated. But president of Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C., Bobby Cordano, I asked her about the intersectionality. And you'll recall she talks about, you know, as a woman, a gay woman, a mother, a female college president, I mean, what do you lead with? And she basically said that the stressor, what's ever the most stressed is what you lead with. So if you're going to a college president convention and it's all males, then you're going to present your female self. If you're going into an all hearing audience and you're deaf, you're going to present your deaf self because that's going to be the most stressed thing. There's so many boxes we all check now. I'm hoping we'll get to a day when we're not checking boxes at all and you just meet the person for who they are. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like when folks say, well, we'll go, what do we call you? Because you're, you're, you're English, but American. You're black, but you're also mixed. And you're this. It's like, like, just call me Errol. Even to call someone a white person, what the heck does that mean? Okay. Labels are quite reductive anyway, but if we could describe people based on where they're from and where their, an- their most recent ancestry is from, 
you know, to call me a, an English Jamaican would be a little more accurate. It tells you a little bit more of someone's experiences and who they are and where they've been. I mean, you've interviewed so many notable, you know, presidents and leaders, John Lewis, Pete Buttigieg, Joe Biden, Donald Trump. Do you have any sort of favorites that you want to share or a story? I mean, for all the people you've just mentioned, John Lewis, this time I interviewed him was at Channel One, and it was during one of those anniversaries of Bloody Sunday, uh, only Edmund Pettus Bridge. He was like in his 20s, early to mid 20s, mm -hmm. when he stood up to state troopers who wanted to stop him and other nonviolent marchers from just requesting equality. He was so stoic during his entire career, professional, uh, you know, in politics. The the fire in his belly is a, a young man that really changed, helped to change the world. When I was in South Africa, had the privilege of meeting two of Nelson Mandela's best friends. Um, Ahmed Kathrada was one of them. These were men that he was hiding out with at a compound called Lily's Leaf uh, when he was um, a revolutionary, I guess you could say. Th there was amazing similarities there. You know, These were young men who were highly educated and seeing the discrepancies between what people say and what people do. And if there's one thing that I just love and that I especially like to press politicians on is it's that space between what is said, what is policy, what was, what's what been in your speech and the actions that we see in the country. I mean, even just with the United States, all men are created equal. OK, that's what we say. Let's look at the data. Any opportunity I, I, I get to kind of push powerful influential people on those types of topics and narratives, I relish because in the explanation of that space between the two, you start to see how people really kind of draw around the lines and kind yeah. of figure out their own um, interpretation of what that means. And I think young people don't accept the interpretation of their parents and their grandparents. They say, I don't think so, especially with the Me Too movement, I think largely driven by young millennial women, Gen Z women who are entering the workplace, educated and say, hang on a minute. Yeah. I don't think that type of commentary and behavior is OK for me, even if older women are OK with it. I'm reminded of Margaret Tutwiler when she ran the communications for the New York Stock Exchange. And she once spoke at a lunch. And I can remember saying, I always tell the truth, but I can tap dance. <laughs> I think, exactly. Like truth is the standard. And if you yes. cross that line, yes, you can't rehabilitate that. I and don't. it's very revealing when you press somebody and you see how they bend the rules or they bend their own definition of the rules in order to make it work for them. That shows you their character. Words of wisdom, either for young professionals starting out journalists or not. And then on the other end, those who are further along in their careers, maybe have been disrupted by COVID or ageism or mm. downsizing, which is now happening, as you know, in the journalism world as well. Any words of wisdom? Oh, absolutely. First, I'll, I'll say that when it comes to young people entering this field or any other profession where they want to earn a high income, the one question I never asked when I was younger, when I was kind of shadowing journalists and speaking to anchors and trying to kind of find my way, you know, I was always asking, what does the job require? You know, what do I need to do? What do I need to study? Where do I need to go? Who do I need to talk to? I never asked, what does it cost? There is not a single executive, high-powered person, famous person, a successful professional anywhere who didn't have to give something really special up, mm. whether that was the pursuit of their own family, time with their friends and kids, or the opportunity to explore any of your other interests that have nothing to do with you earning a dollar. One of the big pieces of advice I try to give to people, specifically in journalism, because the news is heavy and it never ends, is be mindful of what it will cost you. Mm -hmm. And when you realize what it will cost you, take the precautions. Like I, I have been the recipient of the wisdom and the guidance of so many older people in this industry. I know you had Richard Quest on your podcast earlier, who was at CNN when I was there. He gave me great advice. Um, I found that John Lewis's guidance was incredible. I'm part of an organization called NABJ, National Association of Black Journalists. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I try to emphasize to younger people, I guess middle management who's, who's running things, is that Older folks still have value 
in all of the new things happening in the world. Like we think, oh, just hire the young kids because they're cheaper and they know how to tweet and use Slack and all these kind of technologies and TikTok. Um, older people have lived experience that is so incredibly valuable these days as we watch suicide rates increase. We watch seemingly successful, happy, joyful people taking their own lives because something's missing, because it's not enough to just have objects and items in our life. We need value and we need to see each other and hear each other. And older people have those secrets. They have those keys. And so I would encourage older people to share those stories. If you've experienced something and you've never written it down, there's a big reason why I'm writing about so many of my experiences, then it disappears with you. You must share your experiences, share your stories, share your lessons. That's what our value is as humans. They also have vast networks. I mean, yeah. the, the, I say you can't age a fine wine overnight. So if you're working in any space, any sector, any geography, a more senior person is probably going to be have just a greater network to tap into, which mm-hmm. is invaluable. And mm-hmm. it's not digital necessarily. It's old school, right? Like just having real authentic relationships. And we have to lean into those things. The other thing I was going to say is this podcast is very much that. I, I like to think of these as oral histories of leaders in the moment that we're living in. So, you know, see, people can look back on these times and see like, what did Sally Sussman do at Pfizer when COVID broke out? Mm-hmm. You know, what was Joe Evangelisi doing at J.P. Morgan Chase when, you know, court decisions were being made about the LGBTQ community and Jamie Dimon was taking needed counsel? So that's very much I share that with you, Errol. It's a, it's a really important point, And I appreciate that. And the last thing I'll share is it's kind of in the same vein as your your advice. I ask people when I'm coaching them, career coaching, like, to what end do you want this? I think it's wise to ask about the trade-offs or the costs. It's a really good one. And you've spoken passionately about your own life experience. But I find people also, they say they want to do this. They want to fix the world. They want to do something in the sports world or they want to be an influencer. It doesn't matter what they say. I always want them to try and understand to what end they want it. Because yes. then that will help them understand what's really motivating them and might reveal that that's not necessarily the healthiest or that's exactly where they need to tune into. And to your point, Toby, you know, I had to say that to myself more recently. I had never felt that I had succeeded at any point in my career. So mm-hmm. as, as generous and as complimentary as you've been about some of the things I've done, at no point did I feel like I had done it. Everything I felt was the step to the next thing, but there was always a next thing. So after so many relocations, I had to say to myself, and it took the pandemic and slowing down and waking up to realize that actually I had achieved the dream of my teenage self way back in high school when I was starting this whole thing. Mm-hmm. I'm now the guy on the television, in the suit, at the big name network doing the things I had always wanted to do. And I had to kind of give myself that grace to say, Errol, you did it. No one's going to come up to you and tell you you did it and pat you on the back and say you're done. You have to give it to yourself. And now that I'm there, I'm hoping to share more of my story, talk to more Tobys in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a really great joy to have Errol Burnett on today, the award-winning CBS news anchor and national correspondent. Errol, let's think of this as 1.0 and I look forward to 2.0, maybe even a 3.0. It's a deal. Thank you, Toby. This is a real pleasure.